Hi, welcome to Beyond Politics. I'm Katherine Clark. Kim Campbell was this country's first female justice minister and attorney general. She was the first female leader of the Progressive Conservative Party of Canada, and she made history when she became this country's first female prime minister. Kim Campbell joins me now to talk about a life of firsts and about her life beyond politics. Kim Campbell, welcome to Beyond Politics. It is terrific to have you here. Thank you. What a treat. Well, you um, you have a you have a busy schedule, so we're we're doubly appreciative. But um, you know, you've you've had a career of firsts. You are um, probably best known to to all Canadians as being this country's first female prime minister. Um, but that was 20 years ago. None of us really likes to count time, but that was 20 years ago. What are you doing now? Well, it's interesting. I never wanted to make having been prime minister make a career out of having been prime minister. But um, as I'm sure your father and uh, so many of my other colleagues recognize that when you leave public life, um, well, it's a bit like having gum on your shoe, for one thing, that people remember and they want you to do things. Um, and you can't quite get away from it. But I held elected office at all three levels of government. I was the first woman prime minister, the first to be born and raised in British Columbia, but I think also the first to have held elected office at all three levels of government. And I realize what an extraordinary education that was in terms of a functioning democracy. And for all of its craziness and all of the dysfunction in Canadian democracy, compared to other countries, it's really pretty good because democracy is a blunt instrument. It's not a precision tool, and it lurches, and it moves in very awkward ways. And we left office uh, at a time when there were a whole lot of new democratic transitions uh, with the end of the Cold War uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, former Soviet Union. And I found myself getting engaged in a lot of projects and activities involved in trying to provide some kind of support to people who were trying to create new democratic societies. And of course, they have to do it themselves. And you can't just sort of instantly do what other people are doing. It's a cultural change as much as anything. But I've found some very interesting opportunities to share what I know and, uh, and to try and honor the incredible education that Canadians enabled me to have uh, by electing me, uh, whether it was to the school board in Vancouver or the legislature in British Columbia or to Parliament, um, and to try and share what I've learned. And I, I'm a lawyer, so you know, practicing law, the, the role I played as justice minister, uh, opened up all sorts of uh, areas of understanding for me and, and useful experience, sometimes for what works, what doesn't work. So I've tried to make use of that uh, while, find, while moving on, right. uh, not living nostalgically, but recognizing that those uh, years that I spent in public office really were an extraordinary education uh, that gave me something to share. You're also very active in attempting to achieve some type of gender parity uh, for our electoral institutions and, and also others mm. around the world. And I wondered if part of that was um, based on your own experience of running. I mean, was that an influential part of why you're working in that field as well? Well, it's interesting, Catherine, because yes, that's part of it. But also, when, I, uh, when you know, my government was defeated, when I had political retirement thrust upon <laughs> me by the Canadian electorate, it was an opportunity to go back to my social science roots because I was a political scientist mm -hmm. before I became a lawyer. And there was, in the uh, early and mid-90s, a kind of flowering of social science research that shone some light on the challenge of gender bias, other kinds of stereotyping in social and cognitive psychology. And in fact, um, I, went to, uh, I went to the Kennedy School in the early part of this century, in 2001 to 2004, I had been there as a fellow, and the dean said, when were you going to come and teach? And I developed a course called Gender and Power, which brought together a lot of that literature. And it helped me to understand a lot of the things that I'd experienced um, when I was a fellow at the Shorenstein Center back in 1995. I was asked to write a paper on the press and politics, and I thought, well, what can I write about with, that's you know, not biased, that's it's not self-serving? And I had just signed a contract to write a, a memoir with Doubleday. And 
I did a, a paper on the coverage of the 1993 election, mm -hmm. and I thought, I'll look at what journalists say about it, because then I'm not saying, meh, right, meh, you're right. meh, meh. And there was a very interesting theme, which was that the coverage was very unfair. And only two reporters, Doug Fisher and um, I think uh, Lucien Gagnon, tried to even understand why that was. Doug Fisher thought it was because the CBC thought I was going to cut them, so they went after me and Lizanne uh, Gagnon. Uh, and it wasn't Lizanne Gagnon, it was another reporter, I have to think of it, it was in a sec, said it was sexism. But when I came to understand, when I got into the literature, uh, oh, they would say things like, Kim Campbell said such and such, and we jumped all over her, and Jean Chrétien said the same thing, and we left him alone. Gee, that Jean Chrétien sure can't manipulate the media. But what I came to understand was that we all have these kind of deep uh, ideas about the way the world works that we start to form from the time we're born. And when somebody comes along who's not the sort of accepted type of person to fill a job, uh, there's almost a visceral discomfort that people have. So intellectually, they may be fair-minded and think they believe in equality for women or for other kinds of people who are not your standard candidates for the office. But deeper, there, there's a kind of a, a discomfort. And so they look for ways to reconcile that and to validate that feeling. So for me, many reporters, and I think the, the Ottawa Press Gallery were the worst because they're the ones who have covered all of the other incumbents. And I remember one person saying, Mel kind of with his lip curling, and you know, I've covered every prime minister since Lester Pearson. And the implication was, and you don't look and sound like any of them, which, right. which was true. So how do they validate that negative feeling? Well, they look for what you never get the benefit of the doubt. The reason why Jean Chrétien got away with it wasn't that he could manipulate the media, but, but they knew him. He belonged there. Whatever flaws and mistakes he made, he still belonged there. He was the guy who'd been there for a long time, and I didn't. Did that not make you angry? Well, at the time, it did make me angry, but at the time, it was just it was frustrating. And if I had had access to the scholarly literature that I then had the leisure to read in political <laughs> retirement, I might have been better at strategizing how to deal with it. And that's why it became kind of a mission for me to teach this, both at the Kennedy School, where I was able to develop a course and get into the literature. And teaching is a great way to, mm -hmm. to learn for yourself. And then to do a lot of speaking around the world. And when I go to, to uh, train women candidates, whether it's in Kuwait or some other kind of far-flung place, I try to help people to understand what they're dealing with. And I actually think now that one of the most interesting challenges for gender parity or gender or equality is this is to really focus on the culture. Uh, our culture is changing, and, and that's why I always say women have to be there. You have, however difficult it is, and however much you will have the slings and arrows of outrageous journalists or people who just don't think you belong there, the only way you establish that a woman belongs there is for women to be there. And they gradually change people's understanding of how the world works. The way we look, the way we sound, becomes the new normal. But the, the first women who go into any of these jobs really bear the brunt of that disconnect between their qualities and what people are prepared to allow them to be. It's really, really hard. Are you comfortable with the fact then that um, you were the first woman and you were the first woman to be class president and the first woman to really be, I think, actively involved in your um, uh, university yeah. uh, school electoral politics yeah. um, and then first woman prime minister uh, were you do you feel that you were in a way kind of a, a sacrificial lamb for all the other women who are going to come behind well I don't think of it as a sacrificial lamb because there are a lot of women who went ahead of me you know I, I'm a lawyer and I think of the women in the legal profession when I started practicing law women lawyers were actually now starting to dress kind of colorfully mm -hmm. and I mean there are a whole lot of things that they did and there were women who were the generation older than us who had had to dress kind of like men and had to be kind of ersatz men and often were very resentful of the young women coming up and their attitude was, well, nobody helped me and, and nobody did help them. And, you know, Madeleine Albright often says there's a special place in hell for women who don't support other women. But a lot of women didn't support other women because they couldn't. Because if they were seen as the thin edge of, of the wedge of women, they would be judged very differently. They had to not be a threat. They had to be the anomaly that the men could accept because they were really good and maybe would make the coffee also. Uh, but some of these women, it was their sheer excellence that forced people to take them seriously and led to them uh, to succeeding. So I feel I stood on their shoulders. 
And if people stand on my shoulders because I, you know, took some of the brunt, um, then that's the way it has to be. I don't, I don't feel resentful of it. I, I feel wistful in the sense that I loved being a politician. And I think I was good at it. And I wish I could have done it more. Um, every political office I ever held, I tried to think of what I could make of it, what I could do, and I didn't just sort of go there. So when even as chairman of the school board in Vancouver, I brought in the International Baccalaureate Program, did a lot of things to try and, you know, make a contribution and change things as a member of the legislature. Uh, when I was Minister of Justice, I mean, I was the first woman Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, and I convened a national symposium on women, law, and the administration of justice, which really generated some very interesting dynamics and changes in, in, in the, the legal system in Canada. So everything I did, I tried to uh, kind of use that opportunity to push things ahead, recognizing that it would require the efforts of many more people to get where we need to be. But I think my own frustrations and my, the opportunity that defeat gave me to go back to a kind of scholarly understanding and, and avail myself of the research that's been done in so many different ways has given me a better understanding of what we need to do and it's changed the culture. So much of it is that landscape of how people see the world, which is why parity is very important and the idea of creating an electoral system in Canada that would automatically elect 50% men and women and change the face of Parliament. Um, I think that's important. It's important what people see. Uh, Gina Davis, the American actress who has created a, a foundation because she's concerned about the very small number of girls and female characters in the media, in books and movies and television. I mean, it's, it's shocking when you see it. She says, if you can see it, you can be it. And that's really quite a truth mm -hmm. that when that's people see women yes. there. You know, I think of your own, your mother's experience when she wanted to use her maiden name when your dad became prime yeah. minister. Well, Campbell is my maiden name. And when I got married, my first husband said, I mean, I was like your father. You know, he said, you know, I wouldn't change my name. Why should you change yours? Your mother wanted to honor her father. Well, it's no big deal now. But, you know, you have, you know, the, the piñata of the person, you know, who first, you know, has the nerve to say, well, you know, it's I a have a name. It's a good way to put it, a piñata, yeah. because it's, it's... It's what you are. It's but you, you are. know what? If she hadn't done it, you know, it, you, you have to kind mm -hmm. of be the one who will say, you know, that's really dumb. And I'm going to do this. And I'm not going to let you, you know, distract me. I want to talk about mothers while we're on the mother topic, because... Um, uh, Moms are a big influence, and you had an experience that uh, you know a lot of young girls probably do have to go through, but a lot of us don't have to. And I, your mom left your family in a troubled marriage yeah. when you were 12. What I hadn't known until I had read your book was that you were at boarding school at the time with your mm -hmm. sister Alex, and the nuns uh, kept back the letters my mother, yeah. that your mother was sending. So you had no context, you had no real sense of what had happened or why. And I wondered what kind of impact that had on you at the time as a 12-year-old girl. Well, it was terrible. And even thinking about it, it will bring back the emotions of fear and uncertainty and dismay. Uh, I mean, it was an awful experience. Um, I make reference in my book to a, a book by Hope Edelman called Motherless Daughters, where she writes about girls who grow up without mothers and I think her mother died when she was about 17 of cancer and I thought well you know that's at least a respectable easy yeah. thing that's what we lived through. Yes, a respectable way to go. Um, but it's odd because my and she writes in her book that girls who grow up without mothers are become very self-reliant uh, and often re resistant of standard gender stereotypes. But the interesting thing is that my mother raised me to be like that. Mm -hmm. My mother raised her daughters to believe the girls could do everything, to understand that it wasn't an universally accepted proposition, and to be ambitious and to believe in ourselves. My mother never, there was never a question that she wouldn't answer. There was always an age-appropriate way that she would find to answer things that we wanted to do. If we wanted to learn how to do something, she was always there to help us do it. So even though my mother left at 12, she left, in many ways, daughters who were able to take this on. Now, it's not that there wasn't difficulty and trauma, but later on, when I had to deal with some of the, the, the disappointments of politics, like after we lost the election in 93, and you know, journalists expecting, you know, or some even assuming that I'd had a nervous breakdown, and I wanted to say, you You've think, been through worse. Yeah, you know, I've been through way worse. And this is awful. And I'm not going to pretend it's not awful. I am really disappointed. I loved being a politician. 
And I had great hopes for what I could do as prime minister. But you know what? The stars were not aligned. I wasn't perfectly prepared. I mean, there are a whole lot of reasons why we failed. But, but you felt that as a child that the experience of your mom leaving was actually something that made you stronger. I think so. I don't think there's any question about it. I, I was forced to kind of discover myself. And later, in my first marriage, I was stepmother. Yeah, I wanted and, to ask... To, and and, you and I'm still to, close to those girls. Yes, and but you had a... Uh, again, in the book, you mentioned about Pamela mm. and how um, there was a stage uh, early in the marriage when you uh, were able to mother her. Mm. I think you put it something as though she allowed me to mother mm. her. And, um, and that was very healing. You found it very cathartic. Yeah, yeah. It was very Why? healing. Why? Well, it was funny because I, it was almost like recapturing that mother-daughter relationship that I didn't have in my adolescence, although not as the daughter, but as the mother. Right. And when I met my first husband, his marriage was over, and I really queried him about whether there was any possibility of it getting back together again, because I did not want to wish on any children what I had gone through as right. a child of a broken marriage. And his relationship with his first wife was very difficult, uh, and I tried to find a role to play with those girls. And as it's, it's interesting, as I say, I mean, Judy, the oldest girl, is not much younger than I am. Pamela, the middle daughter, Mimi, sadly died of cancer when she was 53. Oh. It was really very tragic. But it was really, uh, you know, I, I tried to find the role to play, which is not to substitute their mother, but to be a friend and give them. And, it, and, and I, I wrote in my book the eerie sensation I had when I was teaching Pamela how to use a needle and thread when they, she was living with us the year we were married in England and hearing myself speaking in my mother's voice. You know, that page. But it, it was very healing because it was an opportunity to kind of relive that relationship in right. a way that was, that was uh, very satisfying to me but I, and maybe also helped me to appreciate how much of my mother there was in me. Right. And, uh, and I think also that experience has made me very non-judgmental. It's not that I don't have values, and it's not that I don't want to hold people to standards. I'm not a moral relativist and everything's okay. But you come to understand that good people sometimes do things that are hurtful. Yes. And that some decisions that people have to make for survival have casualties. I think, I think for every single person who is alive that everyone has had to make a decision that... Mm -hmm. Uh, other people may think is, you know, uncharacteristic, yeah. and yet it is a survival. Yeah. It is a... How did you become Kim? Because well, it's not was, your... Well, it was, your well, it was name, interesting because my sister and I have unusual names, and my first name is Avril. Yes. And when my mother left, I think being called Avril reminded me too much of her. I wanted a different name. I wanted to change my name. And actually, she had thought... One of the, Kim was one of the names she had thought of calling me, but she had a friend who was... Last name was Campbell, who had a son. <laughs> and okay. uh, so that's so a, that was a, out. Yeah. And I think, but I think that was part of my coping. I would have a new name. We're going to skip ahead, um, just because I, I don't want to completely run out of time. But um, the leadership, when you mm -hmm. decided to run for the leadership of the Progressive Conservative Party to replace Mr. Mulroney, uh, were you approached to do it? Was it just something that you felt you needed or wanted to do? What, how, what happened there? Well, it was a funny kind of organic thing. Um, when I first came to Ottawa, I had a, my, my senior staffer was a delightful guy named Michael Farabee who I stole from Senator Murray. And we would go to events, and people would come and say, when Mooney steps down, you're going to be our next leader. And that was a bit disconcerting because, you know, you don't want to be applying for a job when there ain't no vacancy, sure. especially under those We've circumstances. seen how that you works. Know, well, you know how delicate it is. <laughs> yeah. But also because that kind of loyalty is really, really right. important. You know, you're in government. You're... And uh, it just sort of kind of grew organically. And it wasn't, and I, at that time, I mean, I thought, well, this is ridiculous. I'm, you know, I have no interest in doing that. I'm learning as much as I can to be a good minister. Um but as the, the years unfolded, uh, I felt I was a viable candidate. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and there also there were things that I saw that I would like to do that I realized I couldn't do just as a minister, right. that you needed to be the prime minister to do it. You had a so. real roller coaster ride as prime mm -hmm. minister, though. I mean, you had um, a, a very high personal mm -hmm. approval rating. You had a busy summer of travel. Then the election came. The election mm -hmm. did not go particularly <laughs> well. Um, and then there was a real, uh, I mean, it was quite a, a crushing defeat mm. for you and for, for other... Mm. Um, for, the, for the party. Right. 
did you um, did you realize after the defeat what it meant for you? I mean, did you wake up and think at that stage, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Or? Well, it's interesting because I had a, a fellow I was dating at the time who came out to Vancouver on election day, and uh, we actually got in a big fight that night because I said, you know, what really makes me feel bad is I realized that my political career is over. And he goes, no, 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 no. And I said, you don't understand. It is. I was very clear. I understood that there would be no forgiveness. Uh, you know, Sharon Carstairs had said to me, don't run for the leadership. You're going to be Mulroney's sacrificial lamb. And there had been a lot of political realignments. And I knew, uh, you know, Pat Kinsella, our pollster in, in British Columbia, had told me what bad shape we were in. And, uh, and I couldn't, and, you know, it's funny, I might have been able to win my own seat if I could campaign there because I was the only Western candidate who beat the reform candidate in the mm -hmm. riding. But I couldn't campaign in my own riding. You know, Jean Sherry, the last two weeks of the campaign, went back to Quebec and campaigned in Sherbrooke to hang on to a seat, but I didn't have that luxury to do that. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, uh, how well it would have worked, but it, there were a whole lot of things that conspired to make it very difficult. But it was very clear to me that I wouldn't get another chance. Yeah. Uh, first of all, because women don't get second chances. Uh, I certainly didn't then. Um, and I was very disappointed, and I knew it. And, th and the, the real question was, what will I do next? My first question was, what is my obligation to the party? At some point, probably going to have to go. But given how badly defeated we were, you know, was there some role that I should play to try and pull some things together that others might not be interested in playing uh, because we were so badly defeated? In other words, is there, you know, whatever my obligation to do, yeah. I would do it. Um, and uh, it, you know, ultimately it seemed like there, the best thing was, was to step down. But, yeah, the, the question was, you know, what do you do next? Now, now, Harvard has this wonderful place called the Institute of Politics, where they invite people to come for one semester fellowships, people who are what they euphemistically call in transition. <laughs> Perfect. And Tom <laughs> Axworthy, who yeah. was at the Kennedy School, suggested to them that they invite me. And it's actually a very kind and wonderful thing to do because you go and people are interested in hearing your war stories. You give a non, not for credit uh, seminar. I did one on comparative Canadian American public policy. And it gives you a chance to kind of think, you know, to figure out. You know, yeah. what do you need to do? Uh, Prime Minister Kretchen very kindly gave me an office in Ottawa with okay. two staffers for a year because, you know, I wasn't in Parliament. Yeah. And, you, you know, the fact that you've, you've been defeated, all of I mean, doesn't yeah. stop the letters and all the things sure. and the papers. So it gave me a chance to kind of organize my papers and deal with things and think about things. And He also appointed you as Consul General to L.A. Los Angeles later, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that must have been a complete reversal of life, I mean. Yeah. First of all, well, you're was, in great weather, yeah. and you're still... Well, it was funny because I had actually said I did not... I, I talked to the clerk of the Privy Council, and I said, now, please don't offer me a job unless I indicate that I'm interested in one because I don't ever want to say no to the Prime Minister. And sometime later, there were some special eminent persons' bodies and things, and I, I called the Prime Minister. I said, I'm not looking for a job, but... If you wanted to, you know, you needed somebody like a conservative, not your party, to sit on an eminent person's body or something, I would be happy to do that. And partly because they completely reversed their position on free trade. <laughs> I thought I could never serve that government because they fight. Yeah, but they, yeah. it's a very liberal thing to do. Uh, anyway, uh, so the next thing I know, I get a call from the prime minister offering me a job to go to uh, Athens or to Korea or something, and I said, well, I just signed a contract to write a book. I don't think I could do that. He said, well, you could write it in Athens. And I said, well, I think you have to work. <laughs> anyway, make a long story short. Then the, I, the idea was that I would go to Moscow. Of course, that I would, would be a natural right. fit. Yep. The Soviet studies. And meanwhile, the Somali inquiry mm. had been reconstituted. Mm -hmm. And I was scheduled to be one of the last witnesses. And I gave them all my papers and everything. And they went on and on and on and on and on. And eventually got to the point where the prime minister actually extended the ambassador for a year to accommodate this. But it still wasn't called. Then they canceled the inquiry. So that was a disaster. And then I got a call saying the Prime Minister feels bad that it didn't work out. But, you know, I think we, it was in Los Angeles or New Zealand or something. And I talked to people uh, that I trusted, and they said, you know, Los Angeles is really, it would be a great place for you. And, uh, well, that's, no, sorry, the inquiry was still going on. That's right, I, I couldn't go to Russia. The inquiry was still going on, and it was canceled while I was in Los Angeles, much to my chagrin. Um, Did you enjoy L.A.? 
Yeah, it was very interesting. First of all, it's a very celebrity-oriented mm -hmm. culture. So you go as a former prime minister, you know, everybody comes to your parties, mm -hmm. and you can get into doors. So you think, right. well, okay, here's a way I can use that political capital to sure. do things. Um, I had the whole of California, so I had Silicon Valley, right. as well as the biotech in San Diego, as well as the movie industry. Yeah. There was a lot of runaway production issues, uh, interesting extraterritorial issues because of the... Um, issues over Canadian companies in Cuba, and I wound up talking about that a lot. So there were a lot of quite interesting issues. Uh, and uh, again, it was an opportunity to kind of build new relationships. Right, and, and try uh, something new. Yeah, I try something new. Yeah. We really don't have much time left, but I did want to ask you a final question, because it goes back to the idea of um, the roller coaster ride you had as PM is also a, a lot like the life that you've led. You've mm. been dealt um, a lot of hands. You have had the ups and downs. Are you happy with the cards that were dealt to you in this life? Well, I think, um, you know, I think Eleanor Roosevelt once said that if you've never had any uh, hardships or difficulties, you don't know how strong you are. And I think, uh, you know, I, I don't think life is something that you can live with regrets. You can beat yourself up for not making the best use of time. And there's sometimes I think, you know, you're a lazy person, why weren't you reviewing your Russian or doing something like that? <laughs> But at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I guess partly also because what I see in the rest of the world, I see people with such worse situations than I've had. And there's this kind of disconnect that, uh, you know, when that young Afghan woman was, was shipped abroad to the United States because somebody had cut off her nose and her ears, and there was a question, should they have shown the picture? Well, the picture didn't show that her ears were also cut off. And I thought, you know, I thought to be Prime Minister of Canada. And, you know, I would like to have there have been several more women prime ministers. I think there will be. Um, but this woman in her country is property. How can we have that kind of a world? And, you, and all of a sudden, again, my mission is, is before me to do whatever I can in a small way to try and change that for other women. So the cards that were dealt to me, sure, I had lots of anguish, but I know I'm strong. I'm not afraid of anything. I'm, I'm still capable of loving and accepting love. I mean, and that's kind of, you know, Freud said the secrets to life are love and work. And being able to love, I mean, there are people who can't, and that's really tragic. I can. I have a great relationship with my mother. I have a sister I adore. I have a husband I adore. I, stepchildren from my first marriage are still close to me. I mean, I have a life full of love, and I have a life with purpose. Love and work, meaningful work. And, you know, those two are what make you happy. And the hand that was dealt to me has enabled me to do that. So I'm kind of a happy camper. Thank you for taking the time to be here today. It has been a real pleasure to chat with you. I appreciate it. And it's a delight for me to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.